Hello. 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 Can't say that word staring at myself. Hello. I'm going slightly insane here in my room, so come and join me as we investigate. We know you've got nothing else to do. Seriously though, I feel like a global pandemic was my only opportunity to release a tuning video in the hope that more than one person might watch it. So thanks for clicking play. I can't promise you it's going to get any less boring, but I can promise you it'll probably be under an hour because I'm going to edit it and take out all my waffle. I'm missing all my pals in Apollo 5, but it's been great to see all their online videos. This one kind of jumps off from Blake's talk a few weeks ago. It was called Multi-Sensory Intonation. It was a really brilliant um, introduction and explanation to just intonation and temperament and harmonic series and a load of interesting things. So if you can uh, still watch that, I really recommend giving that a watch. Um, it's really fantastic. And as I said, this talk kind of follows on from it. Um, so I'm going to be showing you a handy little tool to add to your armory of ensemble skills. Uh, it's something I came across while studying at the University of York under Robert Hollingworth. I was doing my master's in ensemble singing there. Um, and it's also something that um, appears in this brilliant book by Canadian professor Ross Duffin that I was reading around about the same time. Uh, How Equal Temperament Ruined Harmony and Why You Should Care. Strong words. But I think certainly there's some nuances um, that our modern day temperament covers up. And we're going to have a bit of fun exploring in between the cracks of equal temperament. So, just intonation, just tuning. Um, a system of tuning, which is important to note, is not a new thing. Um, it goes back centuries, really. It was commonplace in the Renaissance period. Um, and of course, the mathematical concept can be traced right the way back to Pythagoras in the 6th century BC. There he is with his triangles. I'm not going to get too bogged down there in the mathematics of it all because that's not the point of this particular video. What I want to do is just chuck out a really um, simple concept that will allow you to apply uh, this just intonation and allow us to find really quickly and easily um, our pure intervals. So for example, our low major third. And our high minor third. And that is simply sing your flats high and your sharps low. Now it might seem slightly counterintuitive, but hopefully as we go along, um, you'll see why and how it works. We'll probably end up focusing mainly on the thirds just because they differ the most from their equal tempered equivalents. But it'll be useful for us to get an idea of the distance of these intervals that we're aiming for. So let's just go over a few of the main intervals and how they differ between pure and equal tempered. Just quickly, sense. Simply a unit of measurement used for musical intervals a way in which we can measure the distance between two pitches. So there's a hundred cents in a semitone, and we're going to see just how much wiggle room there is within these hundred cents. So I'm going to start with a minor third. So I've got my keyboard cam here. Um, yeah, I just feel like the minor third is often overlooked. People bang on about the major third quite a lot, but the minor third differs a lot more than the major third when we're thinking about just tuning. So the minor third, in equal temperament is 300 cents wide. But in the pure form, it's actually wider by 15.6 cents. So if we're just to hear that now, I'll tune it up. That'll do, that's 15 cents wider. So instead of this, Equal tempered, pure, equal tempered, pure, okay? So that's the difference there. 
Um, major thirds is lower in its pure form by 13.7 cents. So there's the equal tempered one. Lower that. Equal tempered. Pure, okay. Uh, so that's that one. Fifths, uh, really, I'm not gonna spend much time on. They're no biggie, to be honest. Again, people bang on about fifths far too much. Um, the, the difference between an equal tempered fifth and a pure fifth is less than two cents. So with the thirds, we've just been talking about 13, 15 cents, okay? But fifths, they're less than two cents difference, okay? So it really is marginal, and we're talking in nuances anyway, but this really is a nuance of a nuance. I'm convinced people are just going around singing, high, uh, singing sharp fifths. I'm convinced of that. Um, they don't need to be much higher. I wouldn't spend much time thinking about them. Um, it's the same difference as a fourth. Fourths are wider by, by the same amount, under two cents on equal temperament, and no one bangs on about the fourth, okay? So fifths, forget about the fifths. They'll be fine, okay? The thirds differ a lot more. The minor third is what we now need to start talking about. Sevenths, now they're my little gremlin. That's the minor seventh. Now, in just intonation alone, there's a margin of about 40 cents here um, in the options that we could tune it. And it depends completely on harmonic context and also on what we want to compromise, okay? So there's a certain amount of subjectivity here. If we just take a, do a dominant seventh chord, a C7 chord, looking at this chord, there's a few ways which we can think about it. Do we want a high minor third at the top? In which case our minor seventh there is gonna be raised by 15, over 15 cents in order to get a nice pure minor third. However, if it's functioning as a dominant seventh into F, then a lot of people will want that B flat lowered and that can lower by about 30 cents. So it can be a lot lower, it can be a lot higher and it depends on harmonic context. And when we get to our examples later, we'll, um, we'll, we'll definitely come across a few sevenths and we can tackle those as we come. So we've talked a bit about sense there and it's helpful to know these distances so we know what we're aiming for. But I think it's also important to note here that whilst all of this is based in exact science, Blake showed us the harmonic series and how it relates to all of these intervals. R rarely in reality can we actually get to this level of precision or exactness, you know, in a live performance when we're singing with lots of different voices, with different colours and different vibratos, you know, not all the music we sing is homophonic with all of the syllables that we, in all the parts lining up at the same time. And I really liked the way Blake showed tuning as a real physical thing. You know, it's, it's based on physics and it's also a physical thing that we feel. Um, and so when we're singing, we're not gonna be thinking, right, I'm gonna sing this G 13.7 cents lower because I'm singing a major third. That's not realistic. But I think we can get a lot of the way there. And that's where this general rule of high flats and low sharps can help us. So just going back to this, high, sh high flats and low sharps, essentially it's based on the concept that not all semitones should be the same. Now obviously on our modern day keyboards, in equal temperament, they are the same. An octave is split into 12 evenly spaced semitones. This means that our sharps and our flats sound the same. For example, A sharp sounds the same as B flat. However, as Blake showed us, we know that the major thirds this gives us, for example, are wider than our lovely justly tuned pure major thirds. So we're gonna do a little experiment. We're gonna say, let's say we want our nice pure major thirds. We're gonna tune this keyboard so that it has nice pure major thirds. So, for this to work, sorry, the, the, the software to work, I now have to put this up a semitone. So this is our new C, okay? I'm sorry for those with perfect pitch who are 
now are having a breakdown. That's now our C. Okay, so we're going to tune some nice major thirds. We're going to tune our keyboard. So this first one here, C to E. We'll bring that down by 13.7 cents. That will do. Much more focused. The next one, E to G sharp. It's now even wider. Let's lower that. That'll do. Ah. There we go. Lovely pure major third. And the last one, A flat to C. Yuck, yucky, yucky, yucky. We'll lower this. That'll do. Much nicer. So now we have our lovely pure major thirds. But now look what's happened to the octave. Pretty rancid. So it means if we want our pure major thirds, we have to compromise on the octave. The same would be for any other interval we wanted pure, we'd have to compromise. And compromising is essentially how I see temperaments. Before equal temperaments, there were lots more tuning systems and temperaments knocking about each with their set of priorities and compromises. For example, if someone wanted F major to sound lush, they would tune their harpsichord or keyboard in that way. But F, ma F sharp minor or A major, for example, might sound a bit gross. So equal temperament is, if you like, our modern day compromise. And I really see it as the ultimate compromise because aside from the octave, we have no pure intervals in any key. So instead of having a, a bit of awesome and some grossness, we've basically leveled it out. And as such, we compromise on every interval. And this is great. Of course, it works for so much music and it is necessary for a lot of the music that we play and perform, whether it's jazz or Debussy or Ravel or whatever. But of course, we do miss out on the pure intervals and the purity of some of these harmonies. As Blake rightly said, the beauty of a cappella singing is that we're not shackled to a keyboard or a fret. We're not tied to a temperament. So we're, we're able to then to, to, to investigate between these the, the cracks of equal temperament and distinguish between our high, sh high flats and our low sharps. Interestingly though, there were some instruments, mainly harpsichords and organs, that could also distinguish between sharps and flats. They had split key keyboards. And I think um, listening to some of these will help illustrate this idea of between the cracks of our 100 cents semitone and help us to see these low sharps and high flats. Take a look at this organ built in Mantua in Italy in 1565. It splits the semitones between D and E and G and A creating 14 divisions, 14 notes to the octave. Um, so we essentially have D sharp and E flat as different notes and G sharp and A flat as different notes. Listen to how this affects the chromatic scale. Now have a look at this picture of a harpsichord maker's diagram from the 1600s. This harpsichord has 19 divisions to the octave. So essentially every sharp and flat is distinguished. And you can see here the sharps are lower than the flats. So in ascending order you have, for example, F, F sharp, G flat, G. So here we can see illustrators perfectly clear in instruments. 
or low sharps and high flats. Moving on with our lives. John Bull, English composer in the 15-1600s. He wrote this chromatic fantasia, which I want to play you some of. It's on an instrument that clearly can distinguish between its sharps and flats. It starts in sharp keys, moving from G to D to sort of E major for a bit, and then a bit of A major. And then suddenly this G flat major chord comes in. I just want you to listen carefully to this moment. I'm going to play from just before figure three, the last going into the last bar of this page. I'm starting with this ornamented note, this ornamented A in the right hand just before figure three. Have a listen. Listen also to the nice thirds. Here we go. So hopefully you can hear that lift as we go into the flats, the flats being higher. Let me just play you once more, I'll just zoom in. Uh, one minute, 10. So I think this is from the A major chord, the top line, second bar, A major first inversion, the beginning of the bar. We're going to go back to Italy now. Nicola Vicentino was writing in the early 1500s and experimented a lot with enharmonic shifts and all sorts of interesting tuning requests in a lot of his vocal writing. First of all, I'm going to play you a recording of one of his madrigals, Madonna il poco dolce, played on an instrument called the archicembalo. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Someone please correct me in the comments if it's wrong. But I think it's the Archicembalo. It's basically a type of harpsichord in the 1500s, which Vicentino actually referred to himself. Uh, as you can see here, it's basically a split key harpsichord plus an upper manual, which instead of being different in timbre, as is usually the case now, um, it's actually in an alternative pitch or tuning. So this is probably about as flexible as you can get on a keyboard instrument. And it enabled a lot of microtonal experimentation, which is what Vicentino did a lot of in the 1500s. Pretty wacko. Have a listen. Quite bizarre. Amazingly, I actually found a recording of a current choir, Exaudi, singing this madrigal with Vicentino's tuning requests. Have a listen to them moving between the cracks in between these semitones. Just to remind you, this was composed in the 1500s, 
Now, it's perhaps demanding on our 21st century ears, but I don't know. Let's look at the text. The first line of text, my lady, the small sweetness and great bitterness. Perhaps Vicentino here was expressing uh, the great bitterness here in the way that he wanted it tuned. I don't know. Whatever the case, though, we can hear um, there's a huge amount of potential and possibility outside of equal temperament. And I just wanted to kind of open your ears to this sonic dimension, this whole, a whole other world that, um, that we lack and that we miss with equal temperament. Um, and it perhaps explains why people like Ross Duffin um, find equal temperament so insufficient, because in a sense it paints, it paints over the cracks. Speaking of small sweetness, I'm just interested to hear in the first bar of this madrigal. Have a look here. The interval in the tenor part, so going from the major third, B natural, to the minor third, B flat. Now in our equal temperament, this semitone here will be 100 cents. But let's just see how small this semitone really needs to be through the medium of maths. So, I know I promised no maths, just this tiny bit. I thought I'd distract you with some jazz. Here we go, semitone in equal temperament is 100 cents. Our major thirds in equal temperament, as we discovered earlier, 400 cents. We want our pure one, which is 13.7 cents lower. That gives us 386.3 cents, our pure major third. Okay, minor third, we know, 300 cents. Our pure one, 15.6 cents higher, giving us 315.6 cents for our pure minor third. So, if we're moving from our pure major third to our pure minor third, simple bit of subtraction there gives us the distance between our major and our minor which is 70.7 cents and we'll call this our 70 cents semitone so looking at this first bar in the tenor part there is our 70 cents semitone moving from a major third to a minor third now we'll automatically get very close to that if we're thinking high flats that B flat is going to sit nice and high, which is crucial for our minor third. Just have a listen then to that first bar. Our 70 cent semitone. I'll just isolate the tenor part. Have a listen. Very, very small. So this kind of movement from major to minor happens, must happen all over the choral repertoire. Stanford, Beati, Choral and Via has exactly this movement. Just before the recapitulation, we have this kind of breakdown, choral breakdown, uh, these F major triads going to F minor. So have a listen here to the 70 cents semitone in the tenors and basses Beati. <laughs> Just isolating the Barry part. There it is, our 70 cent semitone, major minor. It's a much smaller semitone than our normal equal tempered semitone. And that is because they are chromatic semitones, i.e., those with the same note name. So A to A flat, B to B flat, C to C sharp. They're all chromatic semitones, and they all need to be small when we're thinking about differentiating our sharps from our flats. The larger kind of semitone are known as diatonic semitones, and they move to a different note name. So, for example, B to C, or G to A flat, and those semitones will be larger. So let's take a look at this chord sequence and start putting it into practice. First of all, just going through, looking at our sharps and flats. So low sharps, first one here, G sharp in the sopranos. Have a look at the chord, E major. So that will give us our nice low major third. Next one is in the tenor part, C sharp, low third of A major. Next one, F sharp in the soprano part. Sing our sharps low, so that will give us the nice third in D major. And now we have a flat in the tenor part. 
Setting our flats high. And here is G minor, so that'll give us a nice high minor third. Next chord, F sharp, singing your F sharps low. Again, D major here. Let's just have a listen to those first few chords up to that D major chord there. Da, da, da. And let's just zone in there on the soprano part and just have a listen to these semitones. Now thinking about these chromatic semitones and diatonic semitones. So this first one here in the soprano part, chromatic semitone going to our low sharp. So that's going to be a small semitone followed by a diatonic semitone, a big semitone, our low G sharp rising to an A. So that should feel nice and bright. Our third there between the A is going to be quite big. Just have a listen to the soprano part here. Small semitone, big semitone. So that first interval in the soprano part is going to be pretty crucial. Nice small chromatic semitone landing on that low major third. Just have another listen. Okay, now looking at the last two bars, this interval in the tenor part, B to C, diatonic semitone, so we don't want that to feel too small a semitone. And of course the tenor is moving to the fifth there. Soprano flat sing high, high A flat. Or another way of thinking about that is diatonic semitone, G to A flat. And of course that will give us our nice high minor third for F minor. And then finishing off with another chromatic semitone in the, in the soprano part. Or think of it as sing sharps low, G sharp for our low major third there. Have a listen to these last two bars. So just looking at the soprano part here, in equal temperament, this A flat would sound exactly the same as this G sharp. A flat and G sharp sounding the same. But in between the cracks, differentiating between our flats and sharps, here our A flat is going to sound higher than our G sharp. And that's really crucial in order to get our high minor third and low major third. Just listen to the soprano part here in the in the last two bars. <laughs> Aside from my pretty rancid falsetto, let's just try and isolate those two notes, the A flat and the G sharp, and just hear how different they sound. A flat, G sharp. A flat, G sharp, A flat, G sharp. And in context, one last time, here's the last two bars. Okay, moving on. Let's now start applying this to some real choral music. Exciting. Purcell's Hear My Prayer, O Lord. Now here we can think about our 70 cents semitone because the whole piece is basically this conflict between major, minor. So we can think about our minor third and our major third being really, really close together, 70 cents apart. Now just before we look at that figure, let's have a look at the very first alto phrase. High E flat, sing our flats high. So that will give us a nice high minor third there. But now going on to this chromatic figure that permeates the whole piece on crying. We're going to want to be thinking about our high B flats and then our big diatonic semitone from the C to the B natural. Or in other words, we want to be feeling 
our B natural is really close, close neighbors to our B flat. Here's the figure slowed down in equal temperament. Now I'm just singing it over a fifth, a G and a D, just to give you some harmonic context. Uh. Okay, so that's our higher thirds, higher major thirds and lower minor thirds. Let's now reverse them to make our higher minor third and our lower major third. Have a listen now to the to this is straight from cry. And just isolating the melody there. So that's a, you can really hear how big that diatonic semitone needs to be. And compared to the B flat, B flat, B natural. Our 70 cents semitone there. A passing moment, you might think, but it happens so much throughout the piece, and especially at the tempo that some people take it. I think it would be lovely to hear a recording of this with those high minor thirds and low major thirds. I think it really adds to the anguish of that figure on crying. Just scrolling down now, as you see, I've just annotated it happening really in all the parts. There it is in inverted in the second sopranos. So they start with the major third, F major, and they just need to make sure that that A flat there is nice and high, so it feels, feels like a big semitone into that F minor. Going further down, we have our first sharp that creeps in into the soprano part, the end of the top line there. So sing our sharps low, and of course we're coming into an area of D major, cadencing into G major. So the basses here have, again, another sharp, sharps low, and of course it's the major third of D major there. Here the basses have it for the first time, have the figure, and let my cry, so that semitone there, nice and big, diatonic semitone. I'm just gonna quickly go to the end now. Of course we're talking a lot about semitones, but it affects all the intervals we sing. So here in the soprano part, first sopranos, Sing our flats high, that needs to be a nice high E flat, and of course it's the minor third of that C minor second inversion chord there, highlighted in red. Now if that E flat is high, it means that the distance here between the F and the E flat is going to feel a bit smaller. So it's going to be a fairly small tone for that to work. And then our large diatonic semitone in the second sopranos will create a nice low major third going into the cadence. Great, moving on. Bruckner's Locusista, another choral classic. Let's just dive straight in. So our first accidental is here in the altos. It's a sharp, sing your sharps low. That gives us a nice low major third there of D major. Second system here, bass lead in ST Marbula. Sing your flats high. That'll give us our nice high minor thirds in G minor, which is essentially the harmony that in this bar. G minor moving to an area of B flat major, B flat major chord here. Now if the basses are singing a nice high B flat, this means that we're automatically going to get a lower, purer major third. This means that the sopranos won't need to worry about reading that chord as B flat major and then lowering their D. And that's the good thing about this rule, is that it shows you who needs to be doing the adjusting, rather than everyone trying to read all the chords and all adjusting, which would create harmonic chaos. It's the bass's job here to keep their B flats high. 
Moving on to the top of the next page, which is often quite a danger moment with regards to tuning. Now this C in the tenor part needs to feel fairly high in comparison to the B major that we've just had in the preceding cadence. And that is because B to C, our diatonic semitone. So often here I feel like choirs have lost the battle before they've even started. And in this C already starts low, which sets them up for failure. Looking at the rest of this phrase, we can see our low sharps and high flaps working quite nicely. Alto part, that diatonic semitone should give us our nice major third in B major. It's the tenor's job to keep their flats high, which will result in a nice minor third in those minor bars, G minor, and then later F minor. And it's these bars really that I think are the problem. They need to feel really lifted. Have a listen to the harmonic progression here, starting with this B major chord and see if you can hear these low sharps and high flaps. Now a lot of directors might try and fix the tuning problem here by just saying small descending semitones, a tip that we hear quite often. But actually, zooming in, we can see that they shouldn't all necessarily be very small. In fact, they alternate. The first one being a large diatonic semitone. The second one being a chromatic semitone, B to B flat. Then diatonic. Then chromatic. And as a singer, if you're thinking high flats here, then that should do the job. Just have a listen to the tenor part here. I'm going to play from the B, so you'll be hearing your chromatic semitone first, B to B flat. Have another listen, really focusing on these bars, the minor bars, G minor and F minor, feeling them nice and high. Here we go. You can hear there in the soprano part, I've actually lowered the F here. So here we have a G7 chord, and I really see it as functioning as a dominant seventh into C there. So there we have an example of our lower seventh. Just have a listen to the soprano part here, the difference between those Fs. Moving on to the last line. Now here it gets interesting. We have lots of chromatic movement. I'm gonna zoom into these few bars. So the first semitone in the alto part, diatonic semitone, C to B, creating our nice G major there. And then singing flats high, high B flat, and there is our 70 cent semitone, going from G major to G minor. <laughs> Now, diminished seventh chord made up of minor thirds here. Now our B flat being high will create a nice minor third between the tenors and the altos. And same with our C sharp, if that's low, a nice minor third with the soprano E. However, that means that our interval between the basses and the altos is really quite stretched. So I've actually tempered here the amount that I've lowered the C sharp. I'll play you this in a second. Then going to D minor, so F to F sharp in the sopranos, sing your sharps low. Now this chord you could see is another passing diminished chord moving towards E minor. Now the fact that the sopranos are singing a nice low F sharp means that this interval will be big. And of course it's a diatonic semitone. So that will mean, without even thinking, that this G will sit nice and high. So we'll end up with a nice high minor third. I'm just going to isolate these chords so you can hear them nice and slowly 
starting with the diminished seventh chord. <laughs> isolate the soprano semitones there from their E. And just looking at the end of the piece, just to finish it off, F sharp in the bass, nice and low to create our D7 chord there, to G, so big semitone there on the basses. And there we have it. Here's the whole of the last line of music. Just have a listen through and see how many of these arrows you can identify. Maybe sing a part. <laughs> the sound of a tenor singing a soprano line. I'm going to leave you now with a quick return to Ross Staffin because I think it's important to note that this high flats and low sharps comes in a particular context where he's referring to string players. So I'm going to read you a little bit. He says here on page 152, And while I have spent a lot of time referring to aspects of string playing, singers obviously have complete flexibility to place the notes wherever they want and are not even constrained by the fixed pitches of open strings. Many people believe that singers should use just intonation, with pure fifths as well as pure thirds throughout. But, as I said earlier, I'm not convinced that this works for much music after 1700. Now I'm certainly not suggesting that this is a one-size-fits-all. With every rule comes exceptions. But not only will I think this prove useful to the vast majority of the unaccompanied choral repertoire. Remember, this is specifically for a cappella music. Of course, if you were singing with a piano or an organ, you'd have to tune to them. But I do think that this can be helpful for music across all centuries. Today, we looked at music by Purcell, who was in the 1600s. But we then went on to Bruckner, who was writing in the 1800s. Next time in part two... And there's plenty more where that came from. I want to show you how we might navigate our high flats and low sharps with even more examples from the choral repertoire and from the 20th and 21st centuries. We're going to be looking at pieces by Parry, Harris, Peter Warlock, Jonathan Harvey and even James Macmillan, if we have time. I'll also try and respond to any questions that you might have from this talk. So do comment below and I'll try and get to those next time. Anyway, I'm hoping that for some of you this has really opened your ears and introduced you to a new sound world that goes beyond that of equal temperament. And for those singers and conductors who might already be familiar with some of this stuff, I'm hoping this general rule of high flats and low sharps can help you to put just intonation into practice, finding these acoustically pure intervals really fine-tuning what we're singing and also helping to fix tuning issues as well. I find this rule so exciting because it's such a simple thing to do. Often people, I feel, are, are kind of baffled by this just intonation thing, um, thinking its nuances are reserved for the likes of Watchers 8. But this rule really allows everyone to find a way to experience it. And so I urge you to go and experiment, experiment between semitones. Blake showed us a way of, I think it was splitting the minor third into five notes. You could also try this with the tone. Ba, ba. So normally split into three. Ba, 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 with the semitone. You could try splitting this into four. Ba, 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 ba. So the lower one being our sharp and the higher one being our flat. Anyway, have fun exploring and I'll see you next time as we continue to investigate. Between the cracks.